All right. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today I'm joined again by Ben Palis. Welcome, Ben. Hey, thank you, Bronson. Glad to be here again. Glad to have you. So today we are talking about Kyle Carpenter's book, You Are Worth It, Building a Life Worth Fighting For. Kyle Carpenter is a Medal of Honor recipient. We'll get into his story, but uh, the short version is he was a Marine who jumped on a grenade to save his uh, save his fellow soldiers and ended up surviving a long recovery and a lot of lessons learned through this. So Kyle's a, a pretty awesome guy from start to finish. This book was fascinating and uh, excited to talk about it. Um, ben, give me your initial thoughts on the book. What you think of Kyle's story? Yeah, I, I really love the book. I thought it was a fantastic story. Um, hearing these types of stories, what people do, it, it always amazes me. Uh, Kyle Carpenter is one of those guys, um, you know, that, uh, I, I had a lot of thoughts that we'll get into as we kind of go through the book a little bit. Um, but it was a, it was a fantastic read. Um, I, I actually read the entire book on, uh, in, in, in one day on two flights going across the country. And I just, I really couldn't put it down. Some of the main thoughts I, that, that, I had that struck me on this are, you know, this is a very young man when, when this happened. Um, if I'm recalling right, I want to say he was around 20 or 21 years old. And that really struck me as having, you know, two daughters at around that same age, uh, or any of us, would we be willing to sacrifice ourselves in a split instant, uh, to save our friends by jumping on a grenade and, and doing something like this, that, you know, changes your life forever. And that's continually what I thought about as I, as I read this book, but it's uh it's fantastic and a very, very inspiring guy. Couldn't agree more, man. Um, this story is incredible. I mean, the, he wanted to join the Marines because he, he wanted to be part of something like bigger than himself. Right. Kind of talks about that in the early parts of the book that he, he just didn't really feel it to go to college. And even though he had a lot of pressure to do so, and and he eventually found kind of his calling in life to join the Marines and, and become a part of, you know, an organization that's fighting terrorists and bad guys and people that abuse others for, for horrible reasons. And, um, he found that in the Marines. And then of course his story escalates from there and just what an inspiring guy. Uh, also, I, I listened to mostly to the audiobook and his voice and his demeanor and the way he sounds, he just seems like the nicest person on earth. I've, I've listened to some of his YouTube and whatnot, his podcast. He's got his own podcast, by the way, so go check that out. But uh, he just seems like the nicest man. And um, after after everything, he still has such an optimistic view. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's jump in, Ben. The early part of the book kind of talks about his childhood. Nice family, good family, right? He is him. And then about four years later, twin brothers and uh, his parents uh, seemed like they were very good to them. Uh, worked hard, a typical high quality American family, right? And uh, they moved around a little bit, but otherwise very stable. Um, he was a good athlete. He was, he was quite small. So, uh, he talks about trying to make the varsity squad in football, which, you know, had some cards stacked against him there being only about, I think he said like 145 pounds or something small kid, but he worked very hard lifting weights and things like that. Uh, the amount of weight he could lift was pretty incredible. So he could squat. I can't remember 400 and something pounds as a, as a very small person, that's, that's pretty incredible. So, um, his work ethic was superb. When Kyle was a a senior, his dad got him a job at the chicken farm, I think. And, and he had to process chickens and stuff and, and just very good blue collar work for a young person. Um, a lot of life's lessons in, in those sports and jobs and the communities he, he lived in. When he graduated high school, his parents 
really wanted him to go to college and he had promised his parents that he would eventually get to college, but it was not for him <laughs> at the time. And so that's when he uh, came across the Marines and decided to join the Marines. You have anything to add to that? Yeah, just, uh, you know, I was struck by, um, you know, his childhood and growing up. Parents, uh, you know, definitely taught him some very strong ethics, uh, very hard work ethic. Um, you know, dad expected him as he got into high school on summer jobs, uh, you know, like you said, to, to, to go work at the same uh, chicken processing plant that his dad was working at to work his rear end off, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, as a father thinking, okay, what do you want to teach your son? Well, I want to ter- teach him, you know, you got to work hard. Nothing in life is going to be given to you. You're going to have to go out and work for it. So let's, th- let's throw him in right now and show him what work is all about. And he definitely learned that and then decided, well, you know, that type of work maybe may not be what I want to do going forward, but it taught him that work ethic that if you want to do something, you've got to go out and work and strive for it. So I thought uh, pretty, pretty good lessons from that. Absolutely. And that shows up in his military career, right? He, as he got into the Marines, uh, he maybe better than most was able to kind of deal with the uh, hard work they throw you in, right? Kind of those hell week type situations where they're waking you up in the early morning or even in the night and yelling and screaming and making you do push ups and run endlessly with no, uh, no end to it, at least not told when the end is. And just those wild things that they do in the military to kind of break you down and then build you up. He had a easier time than a lot of the guys around him just due to that work ethic and his positive attitude too. That's the thing that shocked me throughout the entire book was he was just so positive from beginning to end. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, several years throughout this book, a decade or so. Right. And that, yeah, that's the other thing that struck me as well is that, you know, I, I, I have a hard time believing that, that I would be as positive as, as what he was going through this entire, uh, struggle and, and, and process, you know, and I've read many other books by, by other individuals, you know, who were wounded in combat and wounded severely in combat. And, uh, you know, the attitude exemplified by many of them is just extraordinary, you know, and, and Kyle definitely had that, had that, which I'm sure is, is why he was able to recover as, as well as he did. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, the attitude and work ethic by, uh, by Kyle's pretty extraordinary. Let's get into the Marines. He joins the Marines, does his whole, you know, training and, uh, he experiences that hurry up and wait scenario for a while where it's like, you're going to be deployed, uh, next week, next week, next week, finally they go. And there's sort of this excitement yet anxiety about, you know, we're actually going to fight bad guys. We're going to go to the fire. And, um, he's of course pretty well bonded to his, uh, brothers there and they are thrown right in it. They end up fighting the Taliban and, uh, on various occasions coming into, you know, firefight contact with these guys. Ben, you're the, you're the military man. You should, you should probably be telling this story. Well, um, you know, being a Marine is, is, is difficult. Um, you know, I, I think anyone who's ever, uh, seen Marines, talked to Marines, read about Marines, know that the Marine Corps is difficult and it takes a, a certain type of person to go into the Marines and, 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 uh, to be able to, to thrive there. Um, one thing we know about Marines uh, is that if there's a fight, they're in it, uh, and that's exactly what happened with uh, w- with Kyle and the the Marines that he was with. Um, as soon as they got on the ground, uh, basically they were thrown right in it, and uh, you know had enemy contact and were 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 fighting the enemy. And he tells you know several um, pretty riveting stories of uh, you know a, a, of contact with the enemy and you know, being close to, to, to being shot before and having rounds, you know, of course, zip over their head and zip into the walls, uh, next to them, um, you know, and some, some lead up, 
uh, up until the uh, the event that uh, that actually wounded him. Um, but you know, Marines are in the shit. That's that's what they do, and that's what they're very good at is, is getting into it, fighting and killing the enemy, and that's what they were doing. Um, so, uh, you know, if we want to go ahead and then you know maybe talk about uh, exactly how he was wounded, but um, you know, there's some good lessons le- learned in there about how. Um, you can't really train for everything. It, it, a lot of this for him was on the job training of learning when and where not to put your head, right? So you don't catch a, catch a stray round. Uh, and then, you know, learning some different things about, you know, wanting to be in the fight, but having to watch a door and why that was important. And, and so uh, pretty good lessons learned there for him. Right. Actually, in his very first fight, he got hit in the back i think right below his armor and he he thought he was done he was like i'm hit and went running back in and and he was kind of you know he felt like man i i've barely been here this is my first fight and i'm already i'm already wounded and out uh luckily it actually didn't penetrate i'm not sure if it was actually a a bullet that struck him or you know maybe a piece of brick or something but he he acts like he got shot with a bullet that's the way i i read it and it didn't penetrate um and so it swole up and was super painful and something he had to deal with but he you know he was grateful he got he got to move on to to fight another day which he did he had several others he had he had uh you know his fellow soldiers um got hit one guy took a, a bullet off the helmet uh and then, uh, you know, a variety of different scenarios where they're in firefights. So this all kind of builds up to him and his best friend out there, Nick, uh, being on the roof of a building. Uh, it was their turn to sort of be guard up on the roof. The problem was they didn't have enough sandbags to properly build their uh, sort of protective shell up on the roof where they could actually be by the edge and see over it, but still have protection. So they had to make kind of shorter um, cylinders for them. And he he kind of refers to it as his reclining chair up on the roof. They had to sit back in a reclined position uh, where their, you know, their head was lower, uh, but it prevented them to be from being able to see down to the street right below the, the side of the building you can kind of see the problem here. Um, It allowed Taliban to be able to run along the side of the wall uh, if they weren't spotted from a window or something and throw grenades on top. And so he was up there a couple of different times. At one point they got attacked, but he had just moved off the roof when our grenade landed and uh, basically blew a big hole in the ceiling and and he walked out of a cloud of dust unharmed (laughs) and uh so that kind of was a warning to them like man grenades are coming now it was the first time they had actually been like close enough to the enemy that they could use grenades to to try and get them it was usually some other form of artillery or you know just their their rifles shooting which uh, as long as they had their head below the the wall or the sandbags are pretty much okay and uh at this point the grenades are coming so fast forward a little bit it's his turn to be on the roof again him and his his friend nick are kind of joking about what are you going to do if a grenade comes over that wall and nick says my ass is off this roof and he said i'm right behind you and not much time later, a grenade comes over. Several grenades came over, actually, but one lands in the dust right there by Kyle, and he uh, essentially jumped on it. At this point in the book, he's he's basically saying, I don't remember this event. I don't remember anything about it. This is all from accounts that I've heard uh, and read from the investigation and the people that were there. Anything to add, Ben? You know, I think I think just uh, you know getting into what it takes for a an, an individual to throw themselves on a grenade, 
right? Um, you know, it's always a kind of a joke in business, you know, would you throw yourself on the grenade, you know, to save your team? Um, but this, this actually happened where uh, a young Marine had to make a split instant choice and, and he made it to save his buddy and jump on this grenade. Um, and it's, it's, it's remarkable. You know, there's, there's stories in the past of other people doing the same thing, you know, and it just makes me think, what would it take for an individual to do that, to sacrifice your life, to save the others uh, around you? And, you know, like Kyle says in the book, he doesn't remember any of this, but he made that decision to do it, to save his buddy up on the roof. And, uh, you know, if, if any of us were in that instance, in that instant, would we do the same thing? And I would say, you know, 99.9% .9 of us probably wouldn't, you know, we'd, we'd scramble to try to get as far away from that thing as possible, uh, before it went off. But, uh, you know, because of his, uh, remarkable character and, and sacrifice, you know, he, uh, he, he, he gave his buddy a chance to live, uh, by falling on that thing himself. I mean, very remarkable. Pretty impressive. So the chaos ensues. Uh, people start scrambling to try and save these guys. So his friend did get some shrapnel. Nick was wounded. Um, the medic comes up to the roof and, and immediately goes to Nick because he thought that Nick still had a chance of survival. <laughs> um so they're working on Nick. They try and pull him down through the hole in the, in the ceiling. Now get him down. A couple soldiers run to Kyle and realize he's still breathing. And so then they go to work on Kyle. Uh, he obviously just jumping on a grenade had all kinds of damage, both, you know, things being from the explosion and the burns. Um, essentially his jaw is ripped in half and decimated. He has no teeth. His um, jawbone or chin is split in two. Uh, his is basically his tongue's hanging out of an open gap in his face. Um, so the doc is trying to figure out how to get him to breathe. There's, he's going through the options of you know do I do I cut his cut a hole in his throat? Do I uh, go down the you know, the cricoid bone and try and create a space there with his knife. And, uh, he started shoving a tube in there, changed his mind and pulled it out. And it pulled out a big, basically mucus or bloody plug. And Kyle was able to breathe again. And so he didn't have to do either one at the moment. Um, and so then they start thinking, man, we might be able to keep this guy alive till the medevac gets here. So they're trying to put pressure on all his wounds and things, which is everything. His whole body is destroyed. Um, his torso, his arms, his legs. Uh, they, they describe it a bit more when he's in the hospital that only like a small spot on his ankle was sort of unharmed. Uh, so he's really a wreck. Trying to keep him, you know, enough blood in his body to, to keep him going. Well, the medic tried to give him a shot of morphine just before he gets on the uh, on the helicopter and bends the needle on some of the bandages. And he goes, you know, sorry, buddy. Well, he later describes that the doctors kind of assume that had he gotten any bit of morphine with the amount of blood loss he had had and trauma and damage of every kind, uh, it would have suppressed his heart rate and probably died as a result. That's how close to the edge he was. Yeah. You know, it's it, it, anytime something like this happens, um, you know, a, a series of miracles or at least fortunate events have to happen uh, in order for the individual to survive. And that's exactly what happened with Kyle is that it had a series of just remarkable events that lined up that allowed him to survive. And, you know, one of those being that the, uh, you know, the, the, the stirred on the morphine, um, bent. <laughs> and so he couldn't receive it. I mean, what are the odds of that happening? They're pretty low. You know, the odds of the helicopter getting there in time, pretty low. Um, you know, 
uh, and then him surviving the flight to get to a, a, a medical facility so that, the, so that they could save him. I mean, you know, once soldiers get to those, um, you know, medical facilities, they have a really good chance of survival, but just trying to get them there, a lot of really just remarkable events have to have to line up. And luckily that happened. The scene was so chaotic that their, their medic, by the time Kyle was at the hospital, uh, he describes this guy sitting there smoking a cigarette, but crying and his tears, putting the cigarette out. And at that point he had five different soldiers blood on his uniform. Um, so the amount of chaos that happened at that moment was just overwhelming. And that, that medic managed to help so many people and not just, you know, got shot in the leg people, but people that were dealing with all kinds of shrapnel and, and straight up jumping on a grenade. So a pretty, pretty horrifying scene. So Kyle gets, he, he makes it obviously to the, you know, the, uh, base and they try to, they stabilize him to a degree. And eventually he, he gets to, uh, the hospital in Germany in, in, I believe it's called Longstuhl, which was apparently named as like halfway home. If a, if a soldier can make it there, they are halfway home and, and their chances of survival go up dramatically. So he is so severely w- injured and unconscious and, uh, you know, unstable that he ends up staying there for, for quite a f- few days. And, uh, his family gets word that he's, you know, been injured and sort of the level of injury. <laughs> uh, I cannot imagine being a parent with your kid hearing that your kid jumped on a grenade or at least got hit by a grenade. Yeah, that's uh, right. You know, <laughs> having kids think thinking about receiving that phone call, um, even though you know that your, uh, you know, your uh, your your son is a marine you know, to get that phone call has to be absolutely horrific. Um, but you know, talking about, uh, attitude, right. And, and, and the attitude that Kyle exhibited, uh, his parents exhibited also, right. Um, you know, doing everything in their power to be able to get their, their son home again. Um, and pretty remarkable story about, uh, how that took place. Um, and, you know, mom and dad working together to, you know, keep it together in order to get their son home. Man, I was having a hard time keeping it together, just listening to it. (laughs) But I, I cannot imagine that it's, it's gotta be horrifying. All right. So let's skip ahead. He, he, he makes it through the, you know, the hospital in Germany, he gets sent to America. Um, and he's now in the hospital. His parents can come visit him. And he's unconscious. He's not really responsive, except that when they talk to him, his heart rate goes up. And uh, there are a few signs that he's still kind of getting it. Um, Of course, he's on tons of meds, machines everywhere, breathing for him, making sure his blood pressure stays up, trying to treat uh, both the explosions and the burns. Uh, He's got essentially a oil or jelly or whatever all over his body because so much of his body has is you know exposed wounds um so there's one spot on his ankle that his parents can touch him and uh so his mom basically stayed in the hospital with him the entire time except to go have some food and shower here and there uh his dad was trying to keep his uh other two boys you know, going to school and taking care of business, but, uh, they were in it for the long haul. He eventually wakes up and says, Oh, Hey dad, (laughs) that was his first thing. And that was the first sign that, that he was still there and still normal. Oh my gosh. When I finally heard it, even though I already knew that Kyle's better, I was like, oh, good. He's still Kyle. (laughs) He's still there. Um, But it wasn't all roses after that. He he had all kinds of hallucinations and he was 
he was tortured by so many strange dreams and um, vi- like just hallucinating about war mixed with spiders and uh, redheaded lady in the corner staring at him and like just he he thought his his mom and dad got attacked and his mom was lying to him about her legs being okay and all, like just weird stuff that he had to kind of work through uh even though he was tied to the bed with machines everywhere and uh he knew that he had been damaged but it was just his worlds were all mixed up and it was uh it was pretty scary um took him a while to start kind of coming out of that and putting pieces together in in their real places. So a terrifying experience for him and his mom and his, his family, but slowly, but surely he starts getting better and better and better, both mentally and physically. Now in the end, they had to do dozens of reconstructive surgeries to get his face back together. Uh, He didn't have teeth for several months as they tried to get enough bone and titanium and everything placed in his, in his face to, to be able to put teeth in. Uh, he lost one eye. So then, you know, reconstructive surgeries and a, and a fake eye. He, his right arm was broken in like 36 different places and probably more fragments. So they had to put pins and, and screws and all kinds of stuff just to kind of put that thing back together. And then eventually it's like more surgeries, rehab, rest, more surgeries, rehab, rest, he describes it. So this um, recovery process just takes months and months and months. And it's just so many people, so much effort, a lot of pain, uh, you know, skin grafts, all kinds of stuff to try and put this guy back together. They're even finding nerves, like nerves that work and putting them back into like relocating them to other parts of his body so that he can hopefully restore movement in certain things like bending his wrist and stuff like that. As we skip forward, I think it's worth a read just to hear kind of his process of, of rehab and some, some of his lessons learned. That was some of my favorite stuff is where he's talking about finally come into grips with like his new life. And so I'll read you a little bit from the book where he's basically trying to pour himself a bowl of cereal alone in the kitchen. And he's shaking, struggling to feed himself with his left hand because his right hand doesn't really work. And um, he finally kind of breaks down. He's been so positive, uh, but he starts to break down and he didn't realize his mom was there. Uh, at first. And so he's, he kind of vocalizes like his frustration and he's, he's breaking down a bit in tears. Um, and he says, look at me, like who could ever love me again? Right. And when we see Kyle as this like medal of honor recipient, that's getting tons of attention and you know, selling books and on podcasts and radio and TV and meeting the president and all this stuff. Uh, You're like, everybody loves you. But in that day to day world, living at home, you know, having a normal life, just going for walks and runs and playing sports and marriage and all those things, you know, it's like, that's a different reality for him. And, uh, So this is what he says. He says, that spring night, five months after the grenade attack, everything changed for me. As I sat and cried with my mother, I resolved that I was going to move forward and create a new life out of what I had been handed. My mom stayed strong while I lost it, which lifted from my shoulders that self-imposed pressure to never show a crack in optimism or resolve. It may have been the relief of seeing that role reversal that let me know I could be honest about my pain and my fears, or it could have just been the Wheaties living up to their promise. Whatever the case, I suddenly felt a shift. I was going to let go of all pretense and any roles I felt I had to play. I didn't have to pretend to be strong if I didn't feel that way. I didn't have to act like nothing bothered me. Truthfulness had always been emphasized in my home, and now I realized that I could move forward boldly and honestly allowing my family to help me, to fill with me, 
to cry with me and to celebrate with me. As long as I kept pretending that everything was fine, I was never going to be able to move beyond what had happened because I would never allow my present life to be what it actually was. I thought I was being strong, but all I was really doing was clinging to the past. That moment at the kitchen counter was raw. My vow wasn't backed by deep reasoned thinking. I just knew that I was at a crossroads. I could choose to move forward or I could choose to stay put, but only one of those options was going to count for anything. If I stayed locked in the vision of myself as a broken, shattered, incomplete person, that was all I would ever allow myself to be. That one bit of insight was one of the most important steps I took in my entire recovery process. In the months and years that followed, I would look back on that incident at the kitchen counter as the moment that changed everything, my outlook, my attitude, my trajectory for the future. For weeks afterward, I would wake up wondering, now what? Every morning started with a question for which I didn't have an answer except to do whatever the next thing was that day. When I heard him talking about this, I just was, it was such an impactful insight. Like clearly most of us don't go through this type of incident where we're very healthy, strong, able body people go through an explosion, survive it. Now we're trying to rehab, but our entire body and existence feels different. But what he's saying is basically like the past is the past. I've already lived that. That's part of my history, but it's um, not necessarily what I'm living for. And what I'm living for is today and for the future. And I can just decide that today I've got an opportunity. What am I going to do with it? Uh, you know, apply that to your personal life, your business life, your marriage, whatever. We all have ups and downs, strengths and weaknesses, things that have changed. Uh, and what are you going to do with today to make it count, to make your future better, to make someone else's life better? I thought that was amazing. Guys, very quickly, I just need to warn you that uh, we had a some technical difficulties with our recording and the remainder of Ben's audio did not render correctly. So, um, the remainder of the episode is missing his audio. So even though I'm talking to Ben, he cannot hear that. He mentions several things about, you know, Kyle's character, the way he, uh, recovered. He, he ran three marathons just three months after getting out of his rehab hospital. And, uh, many good comments that we're unfortunately missing, but I hope you enjoy the rest of the episode and I appreciate you staying with us. Man, there's been a couple moments in my athletic career where I thought I am so out of shape. And then I went and did something and it showed me how out of shape I was. The first was I was 14 or 15, uh, ruptured my spleen, had to, had to, uh, keep my heart rate low for like three months. So I didn't jog or anything for three months and then was released to full contact sport activity the day of my first freshman basketball game. <laughs> I almost died. Like it was, I was so out of shape compared to every other kid there that I was just like, how could this happen? Like, like three months took me out of it. The other one that is more, much more recent was just how kind of lazy I got physically during COVID. Um, my, like when I look at my Fitbit and stuff, like my calories burned and activity stuff was way down compared to my typical life. And then I ran a Spartan race. So like that particular race was about 14 miles with, uh, like 30 obstacles and things. And, uh, I just thought, hey, I'll, you know, I, I went and ran a few five and seven mile runs in the weeks prior, but not a lot of training. And when I showed up, I was like, oh my gosh, that was, that was way worse than I thought I should have, <laughs> I should have lost 10 pounds and uh, ran harder and things like that. So comparing my lazy moments to what Kyle went through, literally losing a bunch of muscle sitting in a bed in a coma, like not moving at all to then, you know, slowly getting into rehab and recovery. So he's, he's moving and he's exercising, but in the sense of like a rehabilitation 
and then he goes and runs a marathon. I, I was astounded. Like that's gotta be super painful. And, um, he did it all and, and was in class the next day. <laughs> he, he's a pretty amazing guy. Um, you brought up the scars, Ben. He talks about scars binding us or bonding us, right? He says, don't hide your scars is chapter 13. And tell some stories about how he felt out of place or disconnected with society and different things. But as he met people and they saw his scars, it would frequently start up conversations or even they would just kind of react to him differently, like looking good, man, or, Hey, uh, you know, they, they just treated him differently. And it turns out that our scars kind of bond us. It's a, it's a language we all can understand the way he describes it in the book was magnificent that basically, uh, you know, we all have emotional baggage, but that doesn't often come out. But when you see someone with a physical scar on their body, it's like, hey, you've been somewhere that was painful, that was difficult, that was struggle, and that scar represents it. And you've come out on the other side. And he says, it turns out that everyone understands scars. Uh, gangsters, homeless people, C-suite people, uh, religious people, like everybody gets it. And it's been a very bonding thing for him. Two more points, and then we'll wrap this up. One is chapter 14 is called Stay Motivated, which uh, it seems like I've heard a lot of people on Instagram and podcasts and stuff talk about like, you know, you got to have something more than motivation. I hear Jocko say that, whatever. But interestingly, two of the last three podcasts I've done, it's come up that that Zig Ziglar quote that's like motivation is like bathing. It doesn't last forever. That's why you have to keep doing it. Right. That's not the exact quote, but something along those lines, it's like, you know, you have to bathe frequently because one bath doesn't do it for you. It's like, you got to keep yourself motivated. Like a lot of people act like you should just, you know, not worry about the motivation and more drive off of like dedication or, uh, commitment or whatever other source of power you have. But motivation is an awesome power, right? And so staying motivated by keeping yourself around people who are also motivated or motivating, keeping yourself uh, listening to motivating speeches and music and uh, putting yourself in motivating scenarios, it certainly uplifts you and helps you go farther, right? So don't ignore your motivation, trying to try to find ways to motivate yourself and motivate others. Lastly, he found a way to sort of give back while he was in these hospitals. And so it, him and his mom would leave dollar bills around the hospital and uh, just enjoy the fact that they had done something for somebody that would cheer them up. They never told anyone that they were doing it, so nobody could return the favor. And he says that there's an incredible power when you feel like you've got enough resources to share with others, whether that's physical or emotional or otherwise. And, uh, you know, in this podcast, build the life you want. It's like the whole point is to find where you want to build an extraordinary life. And you can't really do that for yourself or others if you're not giving yourself enough fuel, uh, resources and opportunity. Right. And, and I really resonated with that. Like it, there's something really powerful about feeling like you've got enough to share enough to, to give to other people enough to sort of provide opportunity and privilege and things like that to people that otherwise wouldn't have it without you. If nothing else, an appreciation for what some people have sacrificed for, you know, for freedom and for other people. And, um, our soldiers, you know, are amazing. So, uh, this book of course will be linked in the show notes. So please go purchase this book, support Kyle. Uh, and we appreciate your guys support on this podcast. Please go subscribe, share, help us reach a broader audience. And thank you for listening. Catch you on the next one.